Good morning. Uh, just wanted to say uh, welcome, if you're joining us today, uh, welcome to our time together here. Once again, we are not meeting in person, but we are still meeting, and I'm so glad to have that. Um, I wanted to know how, how many of you are out there watching. I wanted to see, I don't see any pictures. I'm wondering if you could just snap some selfies. Uh, give me some pictures of who's watching, and maybe put a comment in here and let me know where you're from. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to snap my selfie here, even though you can see me. See if I can do this on the fly. No, I can't do it. It's not letting me. No, I can't, but that's all right. I, I want to see some selfies. I want to see some pictures because I'm going to come down here and look at some things. You know, as we get started today, there's a, there's a lot going on in our country. We know uh, the elephant in the room, the coronavirus. But I just wanted to, to give a, a big heartfelt thank you uh, from... Rosemont um, here from the church. We wanted to just say thank you to all those who are on the front lines, who are out there serving and, and allowing this country to keep on moving. Uh, you know, the, the frontline medical care, these teams who are out here taking care of the sick people. For those who are, are driving trucks, north, south, east, and west, to get supplies, to bring food all the way in, I, I just want to say thank you. To you teachers who are stepped outside of your comfort zone and don't have a class in front of you, I, I can relate. I appreciate so much your, your getting online and doing these things for the, the students at home and for the parents who now have to have a, a lot more involvement in, home, and in the home with their children. Uh, thank you just for everything you're doing to raise your children. You know, there may be little ones at home and then bigger ones. Just want to thank you for that. Um, and a special shout out to all the tech people that are making this happen right now. All over the globe, we've got people because of technology, we're able to share God's message and, and the gospel message, the, the message of good news and hope to everyone. So I, I wanted to thank everyone for that. So let's see who's, who's watching here. Who do we have here? Uh, I see Whitney on there. I see Emily Walker. Hi there, Michelle. Hi there, Anna and Katie. Noah, Ileana, Dariella. Oh, Catalea. I don't, know if, I don't know if the little ones are paying attention. I see my mom on there. Hey, mom. Always wanted to stay on camera. Hey, mom. Hey, just wanted to get things started today, and I just want to thank you all for joining us this morning. You know, we're going to do something a little different this morning. I, I want you to, we're going to open up our passage today, and we're going to read out of Matthew chapter 18. Uh, the message we're going to share is Matthew 18, and I'd like you to stand as we read God's word this morning. Matthew 18, I'm going to read verses 15 through 20. Ready? Begin. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Verse 18, truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. The, the title of this message, um, I, I've called it, When Judgment Brings Freedom. When judgment brings freedom, I invite you to bow your heads and pray with me. Dear God, just uh, thank you so much for the, the opportunity we have to come here and to, to break open your word. Uh, it's really cool how even though we're all in different places, we're all sharing the message together and we're, we're looking in our Bibles and we're, we're searching for what God, what you have for us this morning. And you know, as I, as I give the, the thanks, you know, to the, to the internet world, to all the people that are doing different things right now, God, we... I'd be remiss if I didn't thank you first of all and foremost. We, I want to thank you, God, as our Father, as last week we learned, you're the Father of all comforts. You comfort us in all our troubles, and you provide tr comfort in all our troubles. And, and, I, and I want to give you praise and glory and honor. Thank you for giving us the opportunity, you know, in the midst of all this, to reset our focus, to look to the heavens and proclaim that your mighty name, God, I pray that you would continue to go before me in this message as we would um, 
break open your word, that I would speak the words that you want me to speak and the, the, the listeners would hear what you want them to hear and that you would cut to their hearts and show them and challenge them um, in ways that, that only you know. And we pray all these things in, in the precious name of Jesus Christ. You know, when judgment brings freedom. You know, welcome back to another series, another uh, message in our series this week. And the Bible doesn't say that. You know, last week we looked at the phrase, God won't give us more than we can handle. And we found that that's not true. And this morning, we've, we've, we're going to be looking at a, at a different phrase. Today we want to look at the phrase when someone says, don't judge others. Or, we're not supposed to judge others. Or, you know, the King James... Judge not, lest you be not judged. I mean, it's just something that's ingrained in our minds. Well, as I have some questions when it comes to this. If the Bible doesn't say that, don't judge others. What does it mean to judge? And are, when we're talking about judging, are we talking about judging or are we talking about being judgmental? Well, according to Merriam-Webster, this is what to judge, the verb to judge means. It means to form an opinion about someone through careful weighing of evidence and testing of premises or to determine or pronounce after inquiry and deliberation. Judging versus judgmentalism. Uh, Dr. Richard Caldwell and Ken Ram Ramey put it this way. They said judgmentalism is personal opinion and preferences that are imposed on others as if it's God's law. It's as if. That's the key. That's the difference. So when we're called to judge someone, we're, we're called to form an opinion about someone or about actions through careful weighing of evidence and testing of the premises. And then we pronounce this judgment after inquiry and after deliberation, after much thought. As Christ followers, we are actually called to judge. So when someone says, you're a Christian, you're not supposed to judge, they're only half true. They're only half right. As Christ followers, we are called to judge, but we're not called to be judgmental. Well, who do we judge? How do we judge? When do we judge? Why do we judge? And what is the outcome of a church that judges properly according to a biblical context? Well, we're going to get into all these questions um, as we get through our time here today. You know, this past weekend, I was, um, I was in and out, and I was watching uh, in and out of dozing off. I was taking a nap yesterday, and my kids were watching the movie Monsters, Inc. And if you've, if you've seen the, the movie Monsters, Inc., you know the whole premise of the story is monsters scare the children. They come out of the closet and they scare them to try to get the energy from the screams to kind of work in Monsterville or Monster Zone or Monster World, whatever you want to call it. Um, well, through, through a series of events, what happened is some of these monsters actually brought a child back with them um, and it wasn't, it wasn't an intentional, it wasn't a bad thing on purpose, but they did bring a child back, and that was a no-no. And, well, this movie, Monsters, Inc., it featured a, a few different characters. You know, the main characters, the good guys in the stories were uh, Mike uh, Wachowski and James Sullivan, or they called him Sully. But one of the, the key villains in this movie was a guy named Randall Boggs, and he's voiced by Steve Buscemi. If you know Steve Buscemi, just think of a, a cartoon character that's kind of like a slithering uh, snake meets lizard monster thing. That's, that's who this guy Randall Boggs is. Well, in the movie, Boggs was trying to catch Mike and Sully in the act of bringing a child into the monster world. But ultimately, he wanted the child for himself, and he wanted to do something uh, for his own use. His motives were way off, even if the truth, even if the fact that it was illegal for Mike and Sully to bring the child into this world wasn't wrong. You know, so often, is it, you know, in this, in this movie, this, this character, this Randall Boggs guy, you'd see him slithering and slinking around corners, and he had the ability to um, disguise himself and, and appear like he was part of the wall because he was always trying to catch them in the act. And a lot of times um, we think of some Christians like this sneaky Randall Boggs, right? We think of uh, them like monsters who are sneaking around the corners and they're slinking and they're hiding behind furniture and walls and they can't wait to catch us in a sin. Do you know anyone like that? You know, I know right now you're probably thinking of somebody. There's this person that just irks you because it feels like 
every time that, that, that you mess up, every time that you sin, every time you do something that God does not approve of, it's like they jump out of the, the corner and they yell, gotcha. You know, they're, they're, not, they're not fun people to have around. They do make it very difficult. It's because of people like this, I have to say, though, that, that maybe the caring friend who comes around the corner at times and, and catches you when you've fallen into to sin and, and, and actually cares about you, sometimes they, they can't quite get to a place to actually be able to help you. You know, it's because of people like the Randall Boggs in the church that the people who are drifting aren't able to be caught to come back. We're often paralyzed by our fear. You know, if, if, if we're one of the guys who says, look, my friend over there is doing something harmful to them. They're sinning in a way that is hurting them. They're hurting others. They're operating in a place of pain constantly. We know that God doesn't approve of this, and we know that God's not happy about this. And we know that they're not happy because of how they're doing. Well, see, when, when you've got the Randall Boggs in your church running around and, and can't wait to scream, gotcha, it makes it hard for the good guys who care about the other ones to come up and come alongside and help someone. And so they're paralyzed by fear. Oftentimes we're paralyzed by the fear of rejection or the fear of being called judgmental or a Bible thumper. There's almost a fear within the church, within friendships and Christianity, to look at your friend and say, hey, I've noticed you're slipping here. What are you doing? I, I noticed that there's something in your life that doesn't quite align with what God's doing, with what God wants to do in your life. What's going on there? You know, it's the fear of rejection in those moments, the fear of uh, confrontation that we don't often get to this place. It's the fear of this, um, this situation that, that does make it difficult as a Christian in a world right now. I mean, we're up against it. We live in an age of outrage, as Ed Stetzer would put it in his book. Uh, it's, you have to, everything that you do has to be politically correct. We have to be careful that we're tolerant of other people's views and their standards. And the thing is, as Christians, we're called to a different standard, a standard that we don't make up ourselves, a standard that we're not supposed to tolerate because it's God's standard and he doesn't tolerate it. Well, I haven't seen, uh, sometimes you, 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 miss, you miss someone. They are hurting and they're in pain. And they're sinning. And you don't see them around. But you, you don't know what to do. You don't know how to handle it. Because the whole time you're running around with this saying that I'm not supposed to judge others. Don't be judgmental. When in fact, in the passage that we read earlier, we are called to judge others. In fact, our church context should be the place where we can come to the battlefield to help judge others, to examine the situation. We should be able to, to come on the battlefield uh, for those who are seeking help that want to be restored to whole. Our church people should be the kind of people who are respected as doctors and nurses. Doctors to diagnose our problems and nurses to help them out, to help them treat the problems. We should be able to go up to a patient and say, hello, I'm noticing you got that rash on your neck. It looks to me like poison ivy. Here's some calamine lotion. We as the church should be able to say that to, to other, peop other people, to our friends in the church. We should be able to go up to someone who's got poison ivy and say, look, man, I, I got to tell you, you don't get poison ivy from just hanging around in your house. You get poison ivy because you're messing around with the leaves. And you know you shouldn't mess around with the leaves. We should be able to say these things. But that's not what our churches have become. So often we're not allowed to properly diagnose the problem in the name of tolerance or being too judgmental. Or this one's even worse. Well, that's your interpretation of the Bible, not mine. You know, we can't just say it's not our problem. We can't be indifferent to this whole thing. If God let us go like that, if God looks at us and says, that's your problem. That sin that you're dealing with, that's your problem. 
I'm just going to let you go in it. If God had done that, we wouldn't have salvation. We wouldn't have hope. We wouldn't have forgiveness. We wouldn't have reconciliation. Well, here's the thing. The same God that, that broke through heaven and earth to bring us salvation, to bring us forgiveness, mercy, grace, all of the above, is the same God who lives inside of us if we profess faith in Christ. And God wants us to act in alignment with him. If we don't call out sin, then, then how can we preach the wonderful news of forgiveness and grace, of reconciliation and restoration to the, to the world around us? What good does it do to preach about restoration if there's nothing to be restored from? We've got to do these things. Why would the world want that? Well, God's forgiveness, we have to remember, it's bigger than our sin, and we should celebrate that. We shouldn't ignore it. We're actually showing the grace of God when we go and talk to a friend and we tell them what's going on with their life. And we judge and we critique. And Jesus has given us examples of how to do that. But here's the key. Jesus gave examples of how to judge one another compassionately, graciously, gracefully. And in Matthew 18, this is what we come away with. We judge to restore that's what we do. We judge to restore, not to resent, not to reject, and certainly not to destroy. If you're judging someone with the intention of destroying them or their reputation, then you're doing it wrong. And God's going to deal with you. If you're judging someone because, uh, and you're putting them in, in a place that, that they're resenting you because you're not coming with compassion, then that's a problem that you have to deal with. If you're judging someone with the intention of, I just want to reject you and be done with you. That's not how Jesus set it up. In, in, in verse 15, 18, 15, Matthew 18, 15, he says, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault. Just between the two of you, if they listen to you, you've won them over. Well, who are we to judge? Well, we see right here. Who are the people that are supposed to do the judging and who are they supposed to be judging? Well, it says here, brother and sister. If your brother or sister sins, you know, some translations, if your brother or sister sins against you, you know, there's some textual criticism here, and we're not sure if that last part is supposed to be there or not. Um, but regardless, the, the passage still follows the same process. But here's the key. Who are we to judge? Our brothers. It's not about judging someone who's not professed faith in Christ. It's not about judging an unbeliever. It's not about judging someone who says, look, I don't want any part in God right now. Because they're not trying to live by God's standard. But if you've raised your hand, if you professed, hey, Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior of my life, then you fall into this category of brothers. And it's a family you know, Jesus doesn't say here, this is Jesus talking. He doesn't say if, if a Christian sins, go and point out their fault. He says if your brother or sister sins. It's a picture of a relationship. It's a familial relationship. It's your family. Someone who you're close to. This is not about those, those who are, uh, you know, away from you who you don't know. Here's the thing. One of the takeaways from this very first verse and this very first praise, if your brother or sister sins, if they're to be your brother or sister, they're to be family, then you've got to know them like family. If you don't know someone, how can you confront them? Just a side application here. You've got to get to know your family. How can you say you care if you don't know your family? If you don't know someone, how can they know you care about them? You know, this could be against you, this sin, but it might not be. It could be you've just seen someone doing it. But here's the key. It's, it's the idea when this person is sinning of a persistent, of a constant sin. They keep doing this substantial sin and it's, it's impacting people. It's impacting themselves. It's impacting those they're coming into contact with. It's like, it's like the ripples of a wave when you throw a rock into the lake. You see what's happening with this. And here's the thing. It's not our job to be hiding behind bookshelves like, uh, like Randall Hobbs or what is, whatever his name was. It's not our job to do that. And popping out and saying, gotcha, when we see it. But what we should do is we should care about a person. You know, I used to have a dog. 
um, and his name was uh, Ollie. And I lived on kind of a, a country setting growing up, and there were times that he would get he would get away from you know the house area, and he would run and be gone, and we couldn't find him. He would just wander off, and I'd be out and I'd be calling Ollie, Ollie, where are you? Um, and you know I cared about him, and and I and I looked for him. And I went to get him. And there were times that he's all the way over in the neighbor's farm, the cornfield. And I'd go get him and I'd be so happy to see him and I'd bring him back. I was concerned about my pet because he wandered off and because I cared about him. And I wanted him to be okay. And so the question that we have for this in this moment when it says when a brother sins, that that you need to go get them. The question is this, do we care more about our pets than we do about our friends? This isn't an indictment on people that love animals. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying in this context, do we care more about a pet who wanders off, a cat who wanders off, or a dog who wanders off, than we do about our brother or sister in the church who's drifting, who's gone out to sea? Because Jesus here says that we should care about them. We should care. We should go after them. We should look for them. We should make any attempt to bring them back home. And and we can't just say, well, it's none of my business because it is our business. The key is you want to be compassionate. You want to care about this person. If if you're being confronted, you you need to see it through the same lens as well. You know, this passage, Matthew 18, it's it's talking about what, what we can do as we judge others, but it's also talking about the one being judged. It's also talking about his response. And our response, we need to put on the lens that says, look, this person who's confronting me right now, they're confronting me because they love me, because they care about my destination. They care about my next step. They care about where I'm going. Now, here's the thing, church. If the person doesn't feel that or doesn't think that's true because you haven't shown the track record to care, then, then then we're missing out. You want to be compassionate. You want your friends to know that you care about them. You know, have you ever um, gone through a day and, the, and then come home and seen that you have a big stain on your shirt? Or you've had spinach in your teeth after a meal and just wished, I can't believe I walked all day long, went around with this big chunk of spinach in my teeth. I feel so embarrassed. And I, wish, I wish my, my friends at work or this coworker or I wish somebody would have said something to me so I didn't have to, don't have to feel the shame and embarrassment of, of going around all day. Wouldn't you have appreciated it if someone pointed out your fault? It's uncomfortable pointing those things out, isn't it? I mean, I mean how often are you in a conversation with somebody and you see they've got something in their teeth? <laughs> and you're like, should I say something? Should I not say something? But you know that if you don't say something, that nobody else is going to say something and they're going to continue walking and talking and sharing this spinach in their teeth with everybody that they come in contact with. It's uncomfortable, but sometimes we've got to point them out. Hey, sister, I love you. You get that, get that thing in your te- teeth. You've got to get it out because it's just distracting. And I'm sure you would be embarrassed by it. You would be shamed by this if you knew that other people could see what was going on. It's the same way when we point out sin in another's life. It's difficult, but we've got to point it out. And when he says, when you got to go, Jesus says, when you go to this person and, and you... Point out their sin. It's, it's, in the Greek, it's this idea of, of you're, you're convicting someone or you're convincing them of what they've done and how it's wrong. You know, we need these sorts of relationships. We need this sort of thing in our life. We need people to come alongside us. We can't do this alone. We're, as the church, we're part of a body, we're part of a group, and we can't be alone. We need accountability. And it makes it a lot easier to go to a brother or sister if you've already opened the door and allowed them to come to you in the first place. You know, if I look and I say, you know, to, to Keith or Matt or Todd, hey, hey guys, I need you to be my accountability partners. And I want you to come to me when you see me doing wrong. When you see me falling into sin, I want you to come to me. You see, that opens the door. We can't do it on our own. You know, I read an article in the Babylon Bee. It's a satirical article. Uh, you know, it's, it's a company that, that makes jokes out of things. Um, there's irony involved. And, and it's an article about a man who chose um, an accountability partner. And this is what it says. It's, it's, it's this guy's name, 
His name's Ryan McKenzie, and he's being interviewed about his quest for accountability. And it says this, McKenzie says, I've carefully considered all candidates in my life. I thought and prayed deeply over the matter because I recognize I fall short on my own and need someone who won't pull any punches and who will help me to see my blind, sp blind spots. Someone who's godly and mature for my accountability partner. Therefore, the choice is clear. Myself. <laughs> this, the, the title of the article is actually, Man Chooses Self as Accountability Partner. And then later in the article it says, as, as a specific sin-fighting example, McKenzie told reporters that he's installing anti-pornography software on his computer, which will email a list of the questionable sites he visits to himself for review. And McKenzie told reporters that he's confident he can keep McKenzie accountable. Iron sharpens iron, he says. You know, this is a joke, but this is how we function. We walk around like we, we can be accountable to ourselves, and that's not how this works. We've got to open the door. We've got to allow others to judge us. We've, and we've got to not be offended by it. We've got to understand that they're coming in love. So when do we judge someone? Well, if, if someone sins, this sin, as I said before, it's, it's clearly inconsistent behavior that's against God's standard. It's against God. And it's about sin or actions that don't align with God's standard, but it's not about personality traits. It doesn't say if, if your friend has a personality flaw that you don't appreciate, you need to go to him privately and tell him to fix it. This is not what this is about. It's about sin. It's not about, well, this person gets on my nerves because he laughs all the time. That's not what we're talking about. This is not who we're, how we're supposed to be judgmental. And here's the thing Jesus says, though. He, sa he says it in another place. Before you go to this person, you know, we read Matthew 18 and we think, well, the first step is to go to this person. If they sin, go to this person. Well, the thing is, there's, there's something in between that, in the blank space. After you've seen them sin and before you go to them, you've got to check yourself. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, you've got to check yourself. Verses 1 to 5, we see this. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye, you hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then, Jesus says, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Jesus says, look, before you go to this brother, <laughs> check yourself. Don't judge. It's, he says in Matthew 7, 1, do not judge, or you'll be judged. And, and the verb tense here is that Jesus is saying, don't make this your common practice that you're running around constantly judging and evaluating and analyzing everyone all the time, trying to catch them to slip up. He says, don't hand out, when he says judge, he says, don't hand out harsh critique. Don't hand out hostile verdicts on another person's conduct. Jesus says, you've got to think critically in a good way, constructively. You've got to think importantly and you've got to think prudently. And he says, for the same measure, it's, it's, in the NRSV it says, the measure you give will be the measure you get. It's, you get what you give here. And, and Jesus is talking about something a little more than just you're going to get payback from the person you're talking to when you're judging them. He's talking about God. He's, God may look at us and apply the same harsh treatment that we've attached and, and that we've doted out towards someone else. And we've held others to. And if, if we look at this before we judge someone, hey, I'm going to get what's coming back to me, then maybe it might change how we act when we see others fail. Because here's the thing, we've got to be careful how we attack someone when they're down. Because someday we could be down just like them in the same scenario. Something might happen in my life, in your life, that puts us right there where that person is right now. And we want someone to come along compassionately to bring us back. 
So don't say, I'd never do that and go all high and mighty. We've got to come in with humility. And if we can move off this attitude that, hey, I would never do that, then, then maybe, just maybe, we can help. And so Jesus uses a little bit of hyperbole here, and he, and he laughs. It's almost like he's making a joke with these guys, and he's talking to them about how they need to look at things. And he says, look, he says, why are you running around looking at the, the speck that's in your brother's eye? This little minuscule thing. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the log that's in your face? I mean, do you see, like, like the log? I'm, I'm running around with a log in my eye, and I'm telling you, I've got one eye I can see out of. In fact, I just got sawdust in my eye from the log. So I got sawdust and a log in my eye. I can't see you clearly. And I'm trying to tell you how to live your life. You know, Jesus is so exaggerating with this log in his face that he, he uses a word that talks about the rafters and the timbers that are being used to build the temple, to hold the temple. I, I couldn't even hold one like that, even if I had the other guys in the room. Imagine this massive thing. So, so Jesus is talking to these guys who are, who are just in their own world and they're running around full of hypocrisy and judging people, acting like they're perfect. Jesus says, don't do it. How can you look at a person and say, look, you got, you got sin in your life, man. You got to fix it. If that person looks back at you and says, well, have you read Matthew 7 lately? Because <laughs> I got sawdust, but you got a log coming out of your face. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. We lose our credibility. First thing we've got to do is take the plank, take the log, Take the rafter, take the beams out of our own eyes so that we can see clearly. So we got to get right with God ourselves. So when, when you see a brother sin, if, if you see a, a, a family member of your church, if you see him sin, someone you know, your first reaction shouldn't be, I got to post this on Facebook. My first reaction should be, I got to go run to them and tell them how messed up they are. My first reaction should be, God. Help me get the plank out of my eye. Help me get the log out of my eye so that I can go help deal with the speck in theirs. We can't be hypocr hypocrites. So the first thing we got to do, we got to check ourselves, and then we got to check our attitude. We've got to be gentle and compassionate. I've said that multiple times. Galatians 6.1 says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit, you who are spiritual, you who've, who profess faith in Christ, are given the Holy Spirit, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person in anger. No, it doesn't. You should restore that person harshly. No, it doesn't. You should restore that person judgmentally. No, it says you should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves or you may also be tempted. It's about the attitude and approach with which we, we go about pointing out sin. You see a brother sin? Take the plank out of your eye and then approach him with humility, love, and gentleness. Be gracious, be careful. Careful, and watch out that you don't approach them with spiritual pride, thinking that you're above them and it can never happen. Careful you don't fall into the same trap of sin that they're falling in. But be gentle. You know, the, um, there's, a, there's a show that's called The Dog Whisperer, and this guy named Cesar Milan, he likes to train animals, and he likes to train pets. Well, he was talking one time about aggressive dogs, and he says there's an aggressive dog that it needs only one solution, a calm and assertive owner. If you're aggressive with an aggressive breed, it'll only become more aggressive, and it can't help it. It will shoot to a level higher than your own aggression. So we've got to be calm and assertive, but not aggressive. It's the same thing with our friends. We've got to be gentle. We don't want to exasperate, exacerbate the situation. We don't want to raise the temperature in the room. We've got to be careful that our tone isn't wrong, even though our facts are right. We've got to be careful that our spirit is gentle when we come to someone with the truth. And we've got to think, how would Jesus have said this? 
Was he loving in, in saying the hard things? You know, there were times that he came harshly. You know, he flipped over the stuff in the temple because they were just totally doing, taking advantage of people and, 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 and they weren't doing the things that God wanted to do and, and people wanted to come to worship and they weren't allowing them to worship properly. And Jesus, he was harsh in his anger on that one. But the woman at the well, he was gentle. He didn't give her a pass, but he told her, go and sin no more. Love can be straightforward and clear, and we can say what God says about facts and say what God says about facts in His Spirit because we have His Spirit. Well, let's get back to Matthew 18. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. And if they listen to you, you've won them over. Well, why do we need to confront this person? Because every sheep has value. You know, if you read Matthew 18, just before verse 15, you see that it's the story of the 99 and the one. The 99 sheep and the one that's lost. And, and Jesus talks about the shepherd going and getting the lost sheep, the wandering sheep, and how, how valuable that sheep is. And in the very next paragraph, he talks about this sheep, a brother who's sinning, and how we can go about getting them and bringing them back. Every sheep has value. Do we value the sheep in our flock? Do we value the sheep in our family? Or do we just let them wander off? You know, if I love my, my kids, I'm not just going to let them wander out into the street and play. I'm going to holler at them, get back over here. I'm going to tell them before they go outside, don't play in the street. And if I see them out in the street, I am going to run to them as I'm yelling, come back to get them because I love them. I'm not being harsh with them. I'm not just trying to yell at them to yell at them. I'm, I'm trying to bring them back because I care about them. You know, if you, if you love your brother, you, you want to see them forgiven and reconciled. We restore one another. We judge one another to restore them, not to destroy them. And we want to protect the church and its impact for Jesus. You know, there's a whole story in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and I invite you to read that on your own, but this is a crazy story. There was, there was a guy in the story, children, cover your parents, I mean, parents, cover your children's ears here. There was a guy in the story who was sleeping with his dad's wife, and the church was condoning it and acting like it was fine. And so the Apostle Paul writes and says, what are you doing? You're a mess. You gotta, you gotta judge this behavior because look, this it's it's causing problems. He says in verse six, 1 Corinthians five six, your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little le a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch, as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. We can't be individualistic on this. As church members, we, we should care for each other. We should care for one another in a way that we feel responsible for them and their actions. I'm responsible for my actions and how they influence you. Just like you and the church are responsible for how, you, how your, in, your actions influence others. God says, do you want to promote unity? You've got to find the sin and clear it out. But when we, when we allow just sin to run rampant in our churches, when we allow sin to run rampant among God's people, it's like we're stomping all over the God that, that gave us His Son. It's like we're stomping all over the sacrifice of Jesus. Because His sacrifice wasn't worth me trying to, to keep the sin out of the body that He's given us. Our physical bodies and the body that is the church. Well, what happens when you get an infection? What happens when, when sin enters the church? It's like an infection in your body. You get weak. Your ability to fight the infection is on tilt. Your energy sapped. You really, everything suffers. And it's the same with the church. A little infection, this invisible enemy. Many times it doesn't even realize it's in a fight. The church doesn't. You know, we walk around asymptomatic for a week and don't even know that we're covered in filth and that every person that we touch, we're infecting. 
And then all of a sudden the symptoms start to show up and everybody's got it because we didn't take care of it in the first place. Your entire body is struck with a high fever, a cough, you've got respiratory problems, gastrointestinal issues, whatever it is. But if you'd known you were infected, if you'd known that you were sick, you could have done something. You could have got some antibiotics, wiped this thing out. You could have stayed away from other people till you got it cleared up. You could have taken some Tylenol to reduce that fever. It's this, you know, forget going to the gym when you're sick. You lose your power to lift. Forget going to work because you can't think clearly. Forget being productive or effective in any of these situations. I know how it is when I get sick. I'm stuck. I'm done. I'm on the couch. Katie, I can't do anything. I'm a man who's sick. I'm done. That's, we become ineffective. It's the same with the church. It loses its ability to be productive. It loses its ability to be pro- effective for Christ. And so here, why do we judge? Because we want the church to continue being effective. Why do we judge? Who do we judge? The people in our church. We judge our friends, our family. And it's a compassionate judging, and it's a judgment to restore, not to destroy or tear down. Look at what happens when people aren't prepared for a pandemic. Look at what happens when, when churches don't get ahead of the sin in their church. Well, we've got a, a use case in the United States. We've got a use case in the world right now, pandemic and the coronavirus. What happens? There's a chain reaction of problems. That, there's no vaccine. We didn't prepare a vaccine because we didn't think it was going to be an issue. Sin's an issue. The vaccine is to get into God's word daily to pray daily, spend time with other believers daily, have an accountability partner daily. No vaccine means no immunity when the the infection comes. No immunity means people get severely sick, possibly to death. Rampant sickness causes a host of other problems. Everyone scrambles. I mean, look at what's happened right now. Some say it's no big deal, but others say it is a big deal and they go stock up. So the next thing you know, there's, no, there's nothing in the grocery store. And so everyone's affected by that. People become more difficult to be around in public. We've got to practice social distancing. All of these things because we didn't get ahead of it. Look at what happens when people aren't prepared for a pandemic. Sin is like a pandemic in a church. If we don't get in there and take care of it, We're going to lose. It's time to start being preemptive when it comes to the church health. We've got to start taking the fight to the disease rather than waiting for it to come to us. Well, let's back to Matthew 18. You know, the first thing is a private confrontation, Jesus says. He says, go to that person alone. Go to them privately. You've got to have a relationship with them. And then you go to them privately. Your first response is not to blast them on social media. Don't talk about how terrible your ex is all over social media. Don't talk about how frustrated you are with, with uh, you know, your parents or your in-laws or your coworker or your boss or the president of the United States. Don't do these things. Jesus says that's not how you judge. You go to that person one-on-one. You go to them in private first and you talk to them. And you be gentle. You be loving. You be compassionate. Not on your social media feeds. If you have a problem with a person, you go to them privately. And you judge to restore, not to reject. Here's the thing. If we take this step seriously, Friends, as a church, if we take step one seriously, we get it right, then in instances where any further action comes into play, they're few and far between. Because I got to tell you, the rest of this passage, this is uncomfortable. If we take step one and we do it and we allow it to happen in our lives, if we go to one-on-one to people and we allow people to come to us one-on-one and we change how we're acting then we don't have to jump to, to the next one that says if they won't listen, take two or three other people 
or one or, one or two others. That's uncomfortable. But remember, though, even in the, the one or two others, you're not taking them to take them to gang up. It says, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. You're taking a couple other people so that they can assess the situation and make sure that it's not just, maybe you just have a problem with the person. They're looking at it wisely, with wisdom. And if that doesn't work, if you've approached them with grace and humility and you've pointed out the sin and you've got... Uh, two, two other people that say, yeah, it's pretty clear this person's got a sin problem and they still don't listen. If they refuse to listen, and you tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen, even to the church, it says, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Treat them as an unsaved person. Treat them as a person who says, I don't profess faith in Christ. Well, what does that mean? How do we treat someone like this? You know, a lot of times we think, well, it means you just kick them out of the church and you forget about them. But I can't help it. This is Matthew 18. Ten chapters later in Matthew 28, Jesus says that we need to go to all the world make disciples. That we need to be teaching them everything that he's commanded them and we need to do it in his power. Jesus says that we need to reach out to the lost. So there are different instances and this, this, the way that this looks comes in different forms and different fashions. You know, if someone is twisting the truth of God's word and they're professing to be a Christian and they're a false prophet, you call them out and you kick them out. The Bible says that in different places. If someone claims to be a Christian but is clearly living by a standard that is not Christianity, that is not what God says, and they keep continuing to defile their body and others, and you can't have any part with them. But there are some times and some instances where you, you do have to reach out to them. After you've taken it to the church, they, they don't listen. You treat them like an outsider. You still love them. You, ch you still treat them with grace, but maybe you stop putting them on the stage and playing in your worship team. Maybe you, 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 take them, you, you definitely take them out from leading any sort of services in the church or small groups or Bible studies or anything like that. You take away your affirmation of, as a church of them as a believer. That's what that means. It's not about exposing a person to a room full of uh, judgmental eyes. It's about looking at a person and saying, look, we love you and we care for you and we don't want to see you continue to hurt yourself or others in that way. So we're questioning your salvation. Are you saved? And then maybe just for a second, it'll bring them back. And Jesus finishes out that chapter or that passage, 18, 19, and 20, and he looks and he says, look, if you're doing this biblically, then I'm behind you 100%. What happens, what's bound on earth is going to be bound in heaven. I am going to transfer my authority to you as the church in these situations. And he says, if two or three agree about it, then it'll be done for them. I'm going to give you my support from heaven. And it says that where two or three are gathered in my name, there I'm with you. And by the way, you're not alone in this. You'll be, God, Jesus says, I'll be with you in this. If you practice this idea of biblical ju biblically judging within the church, I'm going to be there for you. I'm going to support you. And, and I've transferred my authority so that you can do this. So when someone says, what gives you the right or who gives you the right? You say, Jesus Christ gives me the right to do this to help restore you and bring you back. We'll know in our spirit that Jesus is with us if we do it the right way. What now? How do we fight back? Well, we've got to be preemptive. We need people to develop vaccines. Well, we've got to break open the Word of God. We need people to administer the vaccines. We need to teach God's Word. We need people to take the vaccines. You've got to learn God's Word. We need people to plan for pandemics ahead of time. That's, we've got to be part of discipleship and accountability programs and mentoring programs. We've got to carry around hand sanitizer. Memorize scripture so that you can have it at a moment's notice on a whim. When a temptation comes, you've got a scripture to throw right back at it. Take your hand sanitizer with you. You need disinfecting hand soap. You've got to wash your hands every chance you get. Wash them. Every chance you get, pray for clarity. Pray for God to, to cut to your heart and tell you where you've got sin issues. You need disinfecting sprays and wipes. It's all the same. You're taking God's word with you all the time. 
But you also need a breathing mask sometimes. You've got to filter your breathing. You've got to breathe in the Spirit. You've got to walk in the Spirit. You've got to live in the Spirit. So that He filters out the bad things. So it's setting your mind on things above, on the things that the Spirit loves and enjoys. So that you can breathe clearly in a, in a world full of pandemic viruses. Maybe for some of us, we've got to stock up on ventilators. We've got to be ready for counseling and accountability after the fact by prepare, preparing to give good advice before the fact. Well, how do you prepare to give good advice? You pick up your Bible and you read it. Not just for yourself, but so that you can teach and you can be there for others so that you can gain wisdom and knowledge. You attack all of this with prayer, with being in tune with His Word. You're empowered and living by His Word and His Spirit. And then when the pandemic comes, you attack it with grace and love and compassion, direct truth, facts. Christians, we don't, we don't need to be judgmental, but we need to judge one another and we need to allow ourselves to be judged. Do you need to judge yourself right now, today? I'm finishing up right here. Do you need to judge yourself first? Look at your neighbor. Friends, look at your neighbor right now. Everybody, you're sitting in there. Some of you are just with kids. Look at your, 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 your kids, look at your friends and say, judge yourself. Not judge yourself, but judge yourself. It's not a, a, like a judge yourself, not me thing. It's look at yourself and say, where am I going wrong? Because the truth is, you know you better than I know you. All right, and look at that person and, say, and, and tell them, say, find it and admit it to God. And then tell them, allow God to fix it and thank Him for fixing it. What happens as a church when we do this? When we live lives where we can look at the person next to, each other, next to us and say, look, I've judged myself and I want to judge you because I love you and I'm compassionate and I care about you and I don't want to see you drifting and wandering off. What happens when we as a church do this?